Okay, good morning, everybody. Why don't we get started? So there's only one announcement today, and that is um, I added just a few slides to the auditory lecture, and I also corrected this. We're going to go over this in a second. Um, just because you, you seem very interested in deafness, and so I added just a few extra slides that we're going to go over for um, uh, uh, about deafness and cochlear implants. Shouldn't worry about it. Just go get the new slides, uh, and you'll see the corrected slides there. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to finish up our auditory uh, section. We'll have a, uh, introduce the homework for you, which is based on auditory sensory system. And then we'll move on in the last probably half or third of the class to uh, the next topic, which is uh, we're moving on to the motor system. OK, so I want to get started today first by just correcting a little error in my slide that I should have picked up. There was, uh, if you remember, I really hesitated when I was uh, uh, comparing these numbers, it's because this number was wrong. I knew it was wrong, but um, I knew something was wrong. There are many, many more outer hair cells <clears throat> than inner hair cells. But you remember, the inner hair cells are those cells that um, are uh, um, doing much of the, or the vast majority, 90 to 95 percent of all the auditory um, hearing discrimination that's going on. Um, the outer hair cells, <clears throat> even though there's more of them, they're not doing the actual hearing for you. What they're doing is tuning what the inner hair cells hear. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. OK, so in the new uh, slides that I just loaded this morning. This is corrected. It's highlighted. And the good news for you is that if I make a mistake, I put it on the test. So you now all know the answer to the one of the questions on the next midterm. You're going to know, have to know that there's 12,000 outer hair cells and much less, 3,500 of inner hair cells. So you can all uh, be sure of getting that uh, question correct. OK, so let me move on to um, where we left off which was talking about, so we, we started out talking about the cochlea itself. And what the cochlea does well is it discriminates different frequencies, high frequencies from low frequencies. And it does that by this be beautiful basilar membrane that is sensitive to different frequencies. Okay? And um, we want to move on to another thing that the auditory system does really well. So it, it discriminates frequencies right from the get-go, right at that inner ear in the cochlea. The other thing it does really well is tell us where sounds are coming from. Critical for traffic in New York City, critical for knowing who's talking to you. Um, and it does this by detecting two different types of differences. It also does this by actually having a character called um, a binaural uh, character, that, that is, uh, cells in your ears that are sensitive to inputs coming from both ears at the same time. So what are the binaural cues that help you figure out sound localization? This is, this is what we ended up with um, on Monday. And we talked about two different kinds of, of differences that um, the auditory system is sensitive to. Intensity differences, um, if a sound is coming from this side of my auditory um, space, then it's going to be louder in my right ear than in my left ear. And that intensity difference can be detected by our, our auditory system. There are also latency differences. The sound waves coming from the sound coming from over here, if somebody asks a question from over here, is going to reach my ear first. And so uh, um, uh, in addition to the intensity differences, there are also latency differences that we see. So here's a nice example of um, the uh, uh, um, uh, intensity and latency differences uh, from a sound on this person's left side. Um, the sound uh, comes here. It's louder here. And because of the sound shadow cast by the head, uh, it's much uh, um, softer in the right ear. So that's the intensity difference. And then the, um, uh, um, uh, the latency difference is that the sound, again, is arriving earlier from the, uh, to the left ear compared to the right ear. Um, so there are two kinds of latency differences, not just the initial difference of when does the sound first reach the left ear versus the right ear to tell you where the sound is in space. Um, um, there's, uh, uh, there's not only that, which is called the onset disparity, that is the difference in hearing at the beginning of the sound, 
but there's an ongoing phase disparity because as you learned, these sounds are made up of sinusoidal continuous uh, changes and shifts in, in, um, in uh, the air pressure. And that's illustrated right here. Here is uh, the um, arrival of the sound in one ear, the left ear, happening first time is on this axis. So the earlier time that uh, um, uh, the sound arrives is to the left ear, uh, shown by the red graph. Um, and then uh, it also it arrives at a slightly delayed time to the right ear, shown in the blue line. So at first, there's a clear onset disparity as uh, at the very beginning of the onset of the sound. But you can see the same sound frequency is being perceived by both, both ears. And you can see, and, and the brain can detect what's called an ongoing phase disparity. So all these different cues, intensity differences, onset disparity differences and ongoing phase disparity differences are all the things, uh, the major things that we're using to localize different sounds. We also went over the fact that intensity um, is much easier, uh, differences in intensity are much easier to perceive at high frequencies than low frequencies. So for very low frequency sound, um, it sounds uh, like the same intensity in both ears. It's very hard to uh, um, uh, differentiate that. Okay, so all of this information and figuring out what we're using to localize the sound has uh, developed into what we call the duplex theory. Sound localization uh, requires processing both uh, intensity and latency differences. We use all these kinds of information to process um, uh, sound localization. And as I was just saying, that at very low frequencies, there's no intensity differences. And so the only way we can tell where uh, very low frequency sounds are coming from uh, comes from the time of arrival. Um, so uh, um, um, how does the brain do this? Okay, so we know how it, it processes different frequencies. How does it process um, the timing of arrival of different sounds? And um, this has been worked out uh, most uh, precisely in birds, but there's a similar pattern that's going on in humans. So we're going to go over the major theory in birds, and I'm going to tell you the, the slight twist that we know that happens in humans. Um, and so to do this, I just want to go backwards for just a second to remind you of the pathways of auditory information coming in. So auditory sound is coming in through the outer ear, it goes into the middle ear where those three little ossicles are, and into the um, inner ear. And uh, sound arriving in, this is the right ear, is processed first by the right cochlear nucleus. But remember, sound is very different from the other senses that we talked about because right away, the sound from the right ear is processed and sent over to um, the left cochlear nucleus. So at the level of the cochlear nucleus, we have binaural information, information being processed from both sides of the body. That is sound arriving from the right ear as well as the left ear. And you remember that, that is, uh, uh, that's happening much higher up in the system, um, uh, um, actually, it's, it's actually uh, not happening in that way. There is, uh, um, in the visual cortex, as you know, uh, the right visual cortex processes everything on the left side of the visual hemisphere, and uh, the right uh, visual field is processed by the left brain. So this is a different sense because we have to do much more with it in terms of processing uh, localization of sound. And I just wanted to remind you that at this very first pathway into the central nervous system, at the level of the cochlear nucleus, we get um, uh, information from both sides of um, our auditory world. Okay, so what is uh, um, these different brain, what are these different brain structures doing with the information from both sides of the auditory world? And what they're doing is um, they are processing um, basically the timing difference between when sounds arrive on the left side versus the right side. And they're making the discrimination, is the sound more to the left or to the right. And to understand this, um, we need to know about one particular nucleus. This is a nucleus in the bird called the nucleus laminaris. This is where all of uh, the major work had been done on sound localization in birds. And the key concept here that we're going to go over is that each neuron in the nucleus laminaris, there are a series of 
bipolar neurons. You remember what bipolar neurons are? They're the ones with the cell body and one axon going this way and one dendrite going the other way. These are bipolar neurons. And each of these bipolar neurons in the nucleus laminaris functions as a coincidence detector. Okay? What do I mean by that? Um, let me show you uh, the really nice example from the book. Here is nucleus laminaris, a, a, a section through the brainstem of the bird, part of their uh, auditory system. Here's the nucleus laminaris, and here's a very nice illustration of exactly what happens when a sound uh, is perceived. This sound is on the left side of the bird, okay? And so what happens is that sound from the left side travels in, the sound waves comes in to the bird's left ear, and what you see is the action potential from the left cochlear nucleus arriving at the nucleus laminaris, and it goes through sequentially kind of a line. Imagine this as a line of bipolar neurons synapsing on the den dendrites of uh, um, bipolar neuron in the nucleus laminaris, one, two, three, four, five, and it makes its way down the row here in a very systematic way, kind of a, a topographic way. Now, what happens is this sound, the, the little bird head is, is small, it casts kind of a small uh, sound shadow. And so very soon after the sound arrives to the bird's left ear, the sound also arrives to the bird's right ear, but at a little delay. And here we see it, time is going down here. So um, uh, at a, a little bit later time, uh, that sound is perceived by the right cochlear nucleus and then is projected onto, um, onto the nucleus laminaris um, 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 uh, on both sides. And uh, you can see that by this time, uh, this synapse has gotten all the way uh, from uh, synapsing on uh, um, neuron one, or going through neuron one, two, three, and um, uh, at this time that the information is arriving from the right cochlear nucleus. And what happens is these neurons, um, uh, when a neuron is getting input and getting uh, excitation both from the right, um, uh, sorry, from the left cochlear nucleus and the right cochlear nucleus, and these inputs arrive at exactly the same time, that's when this particular nucleus, uh, this particular cell is excited. So what I mean by a coincidence detector, these cells, these cells, one, two, three, four, five, are excited only when they get concurrent input both from the left cochlear nucleus and the right cochlear nucleus. They're set up in the sense, in, in, in a topographic kind of a, a spatial map, such that when this uh, cell is excited, that means that um, uh, there's uh, uh, the uh, information from the left has come much farther along, has arrived this much earlier than um, information from the right side. And so activation of this nucleus basically conveys the information, aha, I know that information comes from the left side, okay? So if it comes to the right side, same thing. Uh, the, this one would arrive first, it would get farther down the line, and it would be probably neuron one or two that would be excited from information coming from the right side, okay? So what would happen if information arrived exactly at the same time? What would that mean? Yes, there's a question. Yes, it would go to neuron three, exactly. So what does neuron three signal? Where would that sound come from? Yes. Perfect, either in front or behind. Because all the sound coming facing you here will reach both ears at the same time. Actually, there's an arc all the way up. So you can tell uh, uh, all the sounds coming that way. And uh, then you can see that neurons four and five are all going to uh, code the information on the left side of the bird. Um, neuron five codes it. So what does neuron five code? Something way over here on my left or something more like this on my left? Neuron five, what would that code? Way on the left, perfect, right. So the farther, the farther away it is, the, the, more, the more distance that uh, information can travel along this line of cells. And again, um, neuron one would code information on the far right, and neuron code two would code information in the middle, kind of mid-right, okay? So you can see that these lines of cells, this is just a model, but you can understand that these cells are, are building 
a sound localization map in the bird's brain. So it can decode information at uh, all the cells. So neuron three, we're showing it as one cell, but it's all an array of cells that are sensitive to information arriving at the same time. Um, this uh, activation of all of these uh, three-like cells will tell you that information is somewhere here and um, uh, here on the left and activation here on the right, okay? So this is yet another example of a topographic map. This is a topographic map for spatial localization, okay? And again, all worked out by um, a guy named Jeffries uh, um, in, in the auditory um, um, brainstem. Now, what about mammals? In mammals, the superior olivary nucleus is, is the main localiza localization nucleus for sound, and it has two subdivisions. There's a lateral superior olivary uh, olive process uh, that processes intensity differences, and a medial superior olive that processes latency differences. It does it in a slightly different way, but what I will emphasize is uh, you don't even have to know this. You do have to know, you know the, the pathway, but what I want you to focus on is this model. And if you can tell me and, and kind of build a, uh, a model of processing and understand what neuron three is doing and what neuron one is doing, that is what, uh, what I want you to understand. Okay? Any other questions about that? Sound localization. Yes? How do we know whether or not something's from in front or behind us? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, what we tend to do, if you, even if you're not aware of it, is um, if, if you're not sure where it's going, what do you do? You look around. And what that's doing is changing the sound uh, uh, latencies to your ear, and then you could figure out, is it this way or this is this, is, this is it that way? Um, well, you know, no, you don't. You mean, do you know immediately where exactly the sound is coming from? Like whether or not it's in front or behind. Um, you, you can, yeah, you, uh, there, well, so. Even without, um, relying on sight. Mm hmm yeah. So front and behind, that's a good point. So front and behind, you do know. Why? Because my ears have a polarity. So sound can come in and it's actually getting in better. Because remember, the, set, the ears and the pinna here are, are funnels to put the ears, uh, to, put, to bring the sound in. And my ears face this way. They don't right. face, they would look really weird if they face so, that way, so. So whether or not it's from in front or behind does not depend on this model. This, it does not depend on this model. But there's a, a, um, a smaller subset of uh, locations where it is very difficult to tell within the front at, at these different levels, you know, with sound localization alone, it's very difficult to tell. And that's where the head turning comes in. Okay, good question. Any other questions about sound localization? Okay, great. So, um, okay, so now just a few uh, um, uh, thoughts on what happens next. So we have frequency um, 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 exquisitely uh, signaled by the basal or membrane right at the inner ear. Um, we have sound localization being processed by these kind of mid-level uh, um, uh, um, pathway stops on the pathway. What about auditory cortex? There's, there's an A1, primary auditory cortex. Um, let me just remind you where that is. It is, um, the, this is primary auditory cortex on the right side and on the left side. And um, it's right in the lateral sulcus, um, the big middle sulcus that um, separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. And right smack dab in there is primary auditory cortex. What is this area doing? And for this, we are reminded of um, the kinds of um, um, discrimination and time, kinds of uh, um, uh, processing that the visual cortex does. Where am I? Okay, so um, remember in the visual cortex lectures that uh, Professor Hawken gave, he talked about a dorsal visual processing stream and a ventral visual processing stream. What did the dorsal stream do? Anybody remember? Dorsal visual processing stream? Okay, that was for spatial information. <laughs> seeing where uh, or appreciating where one thing um, is relative to, the, uh, to another. 
dorsal, it's the dorsal stream because uh, the dorsal visual areas are dorsal in the brain. And so if you have lesions to uh, something like the parietal cortex, you get a syndrome called neglect. So in neglect, what you get is if you have um, um, right parietal lesions that is processing the left visual field, you actually end up ignoring everything on the left side. And you will only eat, for example, the food on your right side of your plate because that's the only food that you can process the spatial information for. If you're asked to, to draw a clock, please draw a whole clock and you have right parietal lesion, you will only draw um, uh, if you have a right parietal lesion, you'll only draw the right side of the clock, and you won't draw anything on the left side. And you'll, and you'll say, that's, that's not complete. And then the person with the lesion will say, yes, it is complete. They can't process the full spatial organization of everything anymore. So that's the dorsal visual processing stream. The ventral visual processing stream is processing information about objects, all the complex objects. You remember the face area. Um, uh, the um, parahippocampal place area and the fusiform face area, those are all objects, and those are processed in the ventral temporal lobe, the ventral visual processing pathway. And so it turns out that there is a dorsal and a ventral stream in the auditory cortex as well. Um, dorsal stream uh, uh, is, is beyond primary auditory cortex and is involved in um, uh, higher levels of spatial locations of sound. So uh, the lower brainstem areas and the coincidence detectors is a very basic level. But to elaborate that more, we have a dorsal auditory processing stream. Uh, and the ventral processing stream is uh, in the temporal lobe and analyzes the components <clears throat> of sound. And those areas are separate from the visual processing areas. So um, right next to the primary auditory cortex are some of the um, uh, secondary auditory processing areas. The secondary visual cortical areas are, are more ventral down here. Okay. So a dorsal and a ventral processing stream for auditory information. Um, plasticity. We talked, um, we didn't talk too much about plasticity in the visual system, but we did talk about it in the somatosensory system. Remember those experiments where you can remove a finger and see plasticity in the size of the representation of the other fingers that take over, or you can um, suture the fingers together and you get new um, uh, receptive fields that go across the two fingers because now they're, they're really used to be sti stimulated together. It turns out that there is enormous plasticity in the auditory cortex, and the best example of that is your recognition of those four songs that I played at the beginning of the last class. To be able to identify a song, a complex song, by just one note uh, is, is uh, an example of learning and fast learning, fast recognition. And how you did that is you've heard the Beatles' Hard Day Night, how many hundreds of thousands of times. And so that has been learned, and um, the speed of recognition is significantly changed. And now you have a chunk of your auditory, probably primary auditory cortex, as well as secondary auditory cortex that also, um, that, that uh, now represent all of these songs that you can recognize in just one or a few notes. Um, Heschel's gyrus uh, uh, is the portion of auditory cortex that processes music. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, a little while how it's larger in musicians. But I just want to talk about amusia for a little while. Um, you might think that uh, this inability to discern tunes is just what you see on American Idol and those embarrassing you know, first uh, round kinds of <laughs> things. And some of those people may have amusia, but it's actually very interesting. People with what's called amusia do not uh, they, um, it's not like they like to sing or try and sing. Um, they, they hear noise where you and I would hear music. They literally will tell you that um, listening to a symphony or listening to a song on iTunes is like listening to pots and pans being, um, um, being banged together. There's no pleasure. There's no, um, nothing that they could pull out of that. Yet they could still understand and listen to voices and hear, hear sounds and, and language. So it's a very, very interesting um, syndrome that is um, associated with higher level auditory um, uh, cortical areas. 
This is a, a nice figure from your book, and I want to go over this because it's related to the homework assignment that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, it's a specific experimental example of auditory tuning. So how exactly does auditory plasticity work? Well, um, these are studies that were done in guinea pigs to try and get them to differentiate between different tones, OK? And at first, they're not very good at it. Guinea pigs don't have to differentiate between tones. They can certainly hear, but they have a very poor discrimination ability. But what you can do is get them to um, learn a particular tone and discriminate that tone from other tones, including <laughs> tones that are very, very close to it, by rewarding them by only picking this one tone. You do that for a long time, and you can train them for you know, uh, uh, several days up to uh, several weeks on this harder and harder tone discrimination, and then record in their primary auditory cortex and look at what's called the tuning of auditory, primary auditory neurons. This is very similar to tuning of visual neurons, how uh, sensitive are primary visual cortex uh, neurons to uh, particular visual stimuli, the gratings that uh, Professor Hawken talked about. So here, what we see is um, the response of a neuron before tuning, it happened to be responsive to about one kilohertz tone. Uh, but then uh, this little guinea pig was, was uh, trained to discriminate a, um, a frequency a little bit higher at this level right here, okay? Um, probably somewhere around two kilohertz uh, tone. And um, many, 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 many hours of training, they got better and better. They could absolutely discriminate that. They made behavioral responses that, that identified this stimulus. And then they went back and recorded in the same areas in the same cells. The same cell that had a one kilohertz best response before, and here let me just uh, describe these uh, um, axes. This is the response in spikes per second, in action potentials per second of an individual neuron in primary uh, auditory cortex as a function of uh, kilohertz. And so this is, uh, in the blue, a pre-training auditory tuning curve for this neuron. This neuron um, had the strongest response at this particular frequency and had essentially no response at the lower frequencies or at the higher frequencies. Then we gave them a couple of weeks of this intense training at this particular frequency. Let's just call it two kilohertz. And this same cell, when we went back to record it, uh, record it, changed its best response frequency to the learned response. If you actually train your auditory cortex, you can discriminate and you can get the neurons to be sensitive to what you are learning to be sensitive to. And um, that is also best um, illustrated in You and Me, examples in You and Me in a couple of articles that show that musicians, that professional musicians have evoked auditory potentials. These are just evoked electrical activity that can be seen in primary auditory cortex that are 102% larger than non-musicians, OK? So this is after many, many hours of training. They have these bigger responses. And I, I was um, uh, reminded of this when I went to a concert with a friend of mine who's a professional musician. And um, we didn't know what the music was going to be. It was a dance concert. And we didn't know what the music was going to be to this next, um, uh, to this, uh, next piece. And literally, the music almost hadn't started yet. And he named the piece. That, that it was. And it turns out that he had conducted this piece. And so uh, these people that are, are so attuned can, uh, where it would take us you know, 10 notes, 10 bars to recognize it, can literally recognize it by the, um, the complex array. This is a whole orchestra. So it wasn't just one note. He heard the entire orchestral first phrase um, and was able to identify it. And as part of that, musicians not only have higher evoked auditory potential. So auditory information is evoking more activity in their primary auditory cortex. But musicians have 130% larger primary auditory cortex than non-musicians. Um, just showing that, that you can train your primary auditory cortex in, um, uh, um, and, and change actually not just its function, but its structure as well, which is quite, quite amazing. Um, I just wanted uh, to go over for the next few minutes before we get to our demo um, a little bit about deafness because people were asking about it last time. And again, this all comes from your book, but um, um, 
uh, an interesting topic. So there are multiple ways that you can, can become deaf. Um, one uh, relatively common way is called conduction deafness, and it's a disorder of the outer or middle ear that prevents sound from reaching the cochlea. So the most common form of conduction deaf de deafness is a fusing of the middle ear. Remember in the middle ear you have those three tiny little very, very delicate ossicles. The auditory system is a series of beautifully engineered, very delicate sets of um, uh, structures. And the first one that we encounter as we have sound come through our auditory system is those ossicles. So conduction deafness is caused by um, those ossicles basically fusing together. They can't vibrate anymore, and therefore you have no way to stimulate your cochlea, which may be perfectly fine and functioning, but your ossicles are not working anymore. Okay? And of course, the other very fine, delicate aspect of the um, auditory system are those hair cells with the tip links that, that move every time your basilar membrane is moving. Okay, but this, we're on conduction deaf, deafness. Uh, sensory neural deafness originates from the cochlea or auditory nerve. Um, also quite common, people get simply auditory nerve damage. So that nerve is not working anymore, and that information can no longer get to your primary auditory cortex. Um, you could have also cochlear uh, um, problems. So cochlea includes the uh, organ of corti, where all those hair cells are. And we're going to talk about how um, um, uh, cochlear implants can actually help uh, people sens uh, 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 suffering from um, sensor neuro um, sensory neural deafne deafness with damage to the cochlea. Um, um, autotoxic. Uh, deafness is ear damaging effects due to drugs, noise, pollution, or loud sounds. And damage to the hair cells, which can happen, can result in, in um, um, uh, tinnitus, which is a sensation of noise or ringing in the ear. So that's usually an abnormality of um, um, weirdly firing ha hair cells. Okay. Um, just a few more, central deafness, hearing loss caused by brain lesions. So we remember that um, damage to the primary visual cortex will render you blind. If you have full um, primary uh, visual cortex damage on both sides, you are blind. Your eyes may work fine, but it is your brain that helps you see. Similarly, you can have central deafness by large damage to both uh, primary auditory cor cortices. And um, damage to higher order auditory areas, we're going to be talking about uh, language and processing of language, um, can, can cause more specific uh, forms of deafness. Uh, word deafness, unable to recognize spoken words, or cortical deafness, difficulty in rec recognize an auditory stimuli. This is cortical deafness uh, through uh, damage to higher order, not primary auditory cortex. Um, cochlear implants are a very, very valuable tool um, that are really coming into their own. In fact, as I mentioned last time, NYU has one of the, NYU Medical School has one of the premier cochlear implant centers around the country. And uh, cochlear implants are used to treat deafness due to hair cell loss. And um, um, what I thought I would do, because this is so interesting, is just to show you a short video on um, cochlear implants. Do I have that? <coughs> oh, darn. Is it this? OK. I'm going to put the cochlear implant uh, uh, video on, um, uh, on the website. Sorry, I forgot to load that this morning. But um, um, this is an illustration of what exactly happens in a cochlear implant. Your cochlea is damaged. All those hair cells are damaged. So obviously, that, uh, those hair cells cannot provide that information to the afferents that are going back and making up the, the um, auditory nerve 8. So what you have is a receiver, uh, an antenna and receiver. Uh, a receiver is basically just um, uh, um, um, recording the sound. Uh, that, you, that you hear, and uh, what it does is it translates that sound that is coming into the ear, where, where this um, um, uh, implant is, and it translates it into 
patterns of uh, stimulation that it then sends to uh, um, uh, the electrode. Here's the electrode that gets weaved through all of the different uh, um, spheres of this kind of shell-like cochlea. Okay? And so I told you that the base of the cochlea is important for processing high frequency sound, and the apex up here is important for processing low frequency sound. So what this uh, um, a receiver device is doing is taking in the information, decoding it as high and low frequencies, and trying to give a stimulation to these different hair cells that resembles the kind of stimulation that the basal membrane usually gives. That stimulation is going directly to auditory nerve, nerve 8, and that it gives it some form of input. It's not as good as what the ear can do, but that is exactly what these implants are doing. So you can just imagine the level of research we need to know to understand exactly what the hair cells are doing, what that code of translation um, of, of information from sound waves into um, um, uh, action potential needs to be, because if we can um, reproduce that, then we could make a deaf people hear completely normally. Can they hear normally? No, not quite normally. But in fact, it's, it's amazing. Some of them can really function um, at where they were completely deaf before. So it's um, a great example of how neuroscience research, its primary basic research into a sensory system, can help so many people that are suffering either from just completely damaged co cochlea or even hearing impairment to try and enhance what people can't hear. Either they have high frequency hearing loss or low frequency hearing loss. I'm sure a lot of your parents or grandparents have hearing aids that do the same thing, and those are improving and improving, again, through neuroscience research trying to understand this. OK, so now what I want to do is um, get to another, uh, or kind of go back to plasticity in the auditory system. And um, one of the ways we learn about the auditory system and plasticity in the system is by studying animals that are really, really good at um, auditory things. And an example of that is the bat. And you can see that his pinna are very, very big, and they're very different from ours. Why? Because the bat is specialized for hearing and, and producing different levels of sound, particularly ultrasonic sounds. Most of them we can't hear, but they are doing something called echolocation. And let me just show you the, the bat video first, and then we'll talk about echolocation and how you are going to uh, learn how to echolocate for your next homework. OK, here we go. I do have this one. Ripple on the surface of a stream or lake. Start over. Here we go. Nicknamed the fishing bat, its sensitive sonar can echolocate a ripple on the surface of a stream or lake. The signals he sends and receives can distinguish between a fish and a floating leaf. to do that. So if we go back to uh, this, this part where you see his little ears w w wiggling like that. OK, so what he's doing is he is emitting ultrasonic sounds. That sound is going out and bouncing back. And what his little ears and what his auditory system is doing, it is processing that bounced back information and being able to tell based on the um, the, the environment out there, what is the visual world, whether there is a leaf down on that, um, on that pond or there's a fish swimming around. Because the way the sound bounces back is reflecting what it's bouncing off of. So if I was a bat and I emitted a call this way, I would get uh, information back about this column right here. Okay, So it's able to hear uh, and appreciate uh, the difference in uh, what, what the difference is between this column being here versus being a completely 
open room, okay? And it's just doing that by hearing what's bouncing back. And the unique thing there, we don't, you know, we don't usually, we just speak to be heard. Um, they're actually emitting these cells to be able to see. It's another way that they see. Um, they, don't, they don't have poor eyesight. They actually can use uh, their eyesight as well, but often they are nocturnal. They're hunting at night. So their system has developed to have this alternative, very, very sensitive system to be able to hunt um, and see at night and hunt very, very small things like, um, uh, like insects, for example. Many of these bats are not vampire bats, as you might imagine, but they eat insects. And the insects, um, what they do is uh, you can he have a, a kind of an audio replay of what the bats are doing when they uh, are, are circling around trying to see things. So emit little beeps every once in a while. But once they hone in on something, they'll start beeping a lot and emitting a lot. And you can hear them go beep, 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 until, until he gets the insect. Um, OK, so you think, well, that's, that's great. Bat, bat is fine. Um, but it turns out that humans can learn how to echolocate. And so what we're going to look at next is an example of that. Oh, is it opening down there? Thank you. Oh, I think I zoomed it. Try it again. OK, there we go. OK. Okay. A man who has risen above a challenge he was born with. Dan Kish and his friend Juan appear to be a couple of friends riding bikes. Is there anything more than human about this? There is if you look at it from another angle. This is what they see. Both men are blind. So how can they ride bicycles without seeing? More than human took to the field to learn about a new type of human sonar, pioneered by this man, Dan Kish. <laughs> I could probably tap the lens. Uh, oh, there it is. Dan's amazing gift is something he's trying to share with other sightless people. He believes many of them can be taught to see with one of the animal kingdom's most incredible natural technologies, echolocation. A tree. You are correct. Echolocation is the ability to see with sound. It's the ability to use sound to perceive one's surroundings. In a room, if I were to use echolocation, I would have uh, an immediate sense of the size and shape of the room. Then, with more effort, I can pick out kinds of furnishings that it might contain or obstructions in the room. How do they use their ears to see? Did Dan invent something more than human? I didn't invent echolocation. The bats invented echolocation and they're very, very good at it. We stand corrected. Bats have taken millions of years to evolve their ability to hear, by the use of sonar, the tiniest of insects. But how does echolocation work? Bats emit ultrasonic squeals as they fly. The sounds that bounce back through the bat's very sensitive ears transmit three-dimensional images to its brain. This is how bats can have full mobility in pitch black caves and moonless nights. Bats exist competitively in a world that is not forgiving of weakness. And a car or... so so Dan believes that most blind people already use some form of echolocation. His friend Juan Ruiz was not easily convinced. Okay. What he did is he threw some headphones on me with full-on static and uh, he had me search for a panel and I was completely lost. I was unable to identify where this object was and that is a point where I just broke and I said, okay, um, maybe this guy's right. Juan now teaches echolocation. Here, he demonstrates the basic technique. I'm making a sound such as 
which bounces off any objects that are around me. Maybe a tree. It could be a fence, person, car, pole, anything. And sometimes even if I'm not making any noise, like a bush right here where I'm at, the fact that there is air and the air carries sound waves, it'll bounce off objects and I will know that there is something in the way. Oh, and it does. In Dan's development of echolocation for humans, he has found different sounds are useful for different purposes. I use what they call a palatal tongue click, which sounds like this. Uh, a strong palatal click might be used for detecting uh, objects in, in larger environments uh, uh, where there's a lot more open space or objects that are further away. Or if you're in an indoor environment or say a library where you don't want to disturb people. The click that I'm using right now, it's a pretty high pitched. As opposed to the click travels quite a lot further and it's keener. So it, it reflects much better off objects. Dan claims to have reconditioned his brain to process sound differently and to create an almost visual image. In fact, blind people often report that their senses like hearing and touch increase in sensitivity. But how detailed are these images? We challenge Juan, who is completely sightless, to a test of echolocation. We place two very unusual objects before him. Our tall, thin, metallic light pole and a paper-thin sheet of light diffusion gauze. We asked him to identify the objects. At first, on the bottom, it seems like a skinny pole. But then on top, it's a little bit wider. And then something at an angle. Let's see. Incredibly, Juan also identifies a third item, the pole supporting our microphone. I thought I heard something, but uh, there's something right over me. Maybe like a like a tent or something. Now, Juan identifies objects at farther distances. Right there we have a tree and there is a, there's like a building over there. It's very much like a camera flash. Um, you have a flash of sound that goes out and comes back. Um, in this case with sound instead of light. And just as with a camera, or with the retina of the eye, the brain can interpret the reflections as they return to the listener. How incredible is echolocation? It allows Dan and his students to ride bicycles on the streets. When I'm on the bike, I trust myself to navigate without crashing into anything or um, endangering myself because of echolocation. That's okay. right. So I want to make sure we have enough time to do the actual demo. So how many of you, again, are musicians? Musicians? Played an instrument? OK. So you guys already have trained your auditory system. And what this exercise is going to have you do is train that. In another way, don't worry if you've never played an instrument before. Anybody can do this. And it'll also get you working in groups and um, actually doing a neuroscience experiment uh, in your own dorm room. So could I have the TAs come down who uh, we're going to be asking for volunteers uh, and demoing uh, the, the homework for you so you know exactly how to do this. Yes. Or you, you could do it on yourself. So the goal of this experiment is to um, test whether you are able to learn how to echolocate. Okay, so you're not going to be like this guy. I, we're not going to ask you to ride a bike, okay, when you're blindfolded. <laughs> but we will ask you to determine whether there are different items in front of you or not. And, um, And so, so Helena and um, Sarah and Eric are now going to demonstrate. So who wants to? Everything be quiet. Yeah, be very quiet. All right. 
right, so what I'm going to have to do is uh, hold up either a metal pan or a book. Uh, there are two different materials. Uh, they're two different sizes, which is why the connection might be there. So I'm going to take this out. And we're going to start up. Try to see if she can uh, if she can distinguish between between the two. So, uh, can, can you see anything in front of you right now? No. Do you believe her? No. No. no? Okay. We'll, we'll try it anyways. Okay. So, uh, uh, identify what is in front of you now. It, it is. It is the little thing. Yes. Right. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the book. It's the book. Yeah. Okay. Try again. Uh, actually, it's kind of covering my ears a little bit. All right. uh, is it the book again? It is the book again. Okay. She's good. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, that's the pan. Okay. <laughs> See? So. Isn't that amazing? So with some objects, it's, pr it's pretty easy. Let's, we'll try, uh, we're going to challenge you now. We're going to move back a little whoa, bit. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, so we, we hadn't planned this, so <laughs> we'll try it anyways, though. OK, ready? We're, we're going to a foot distance now. It's not that much further. Ready? Okay. Blah, da, da. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't really have a frame of reference, but I'm going to go with the pan. It's the pan. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, so for the assignment, you, ha you have to do a discrimination task with uh, with, with different objects. Uh, in, in object discrimination, obviously it's going to be, become harder and harder as you, as you get further away. I mean, you can see in the, in the video, you know, you can distinguish between objects of different size. You can tell if there's a pole there. Basically, you probably, you're probably get less, uh, less feedback. You can also tell based off, I mean, there's going to be more reverberation from this. Uh, and then I think for the, the, the extra, there's an extra credit on the assignment in which you can uh, detail how well you perform as you, as you increase the distance from the objects. So with the idea that you're able to plot, you know, what range and what range can you, can you do really well and then at what point does it fall off. And it'll be interesting because, because just testing ourselves, we were able to tell that actually Sarah was a lot better at this than Helena or myself. <laughs> so, but we're hoping that we can get some people that are just master echolocators. So, so we'll, we'll who, see. who wants to volunteer? Who oh yeah, who wants to volunteer? <laughs> Anybody want to try? Come on. All this right. Guy. <laughs> yeah, we'll give you feedback. Okay, yeah. Right here. <laughs> Hold up. Wait, do I get reference? Or? Okay, so we'll, we'll start with the reference point. Okay, so I'm holding the pan in front of you now. Go ahead and vocalize. Uh, wait, the, does the microphone matter or no? The microphone's behind. Well, it might matter. Do uh, you think it will? <laughs> the variable. We'll put it down for now.
want to do enough trials to be sure, you know, like maybe 20 or like 50. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> so what were you using? What did, what, what were you trying, what did you hear? I heard a higher, usually it's about 75% of the time. Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> a higher, I heard a higher frequency of pain. Uh-huh. Right? It was like more dull than it was. Okay. And what about you, Sarah? You were getting Um, it. yeah, well, so you can sort of just hear it echoing a little echoing. bit. Echoing, uh-huh. Uh, I mean, these guys have, have uh, um, worked hard to uh, come up with something that you could have some fun at doing. You may not, you might not be good at it. That's okay. That's part of the experiment. So you're going to um, buddy up in either two or three max groups, and you're going to collect data from um, your, each individual person in the group, just like you saw here, and you're going to report that data in graph format. And Tell us what your experimental, uh, what your experiment yielded. Can you um, discriminate uh, with with practice? You can do it a little bit and, and get some practice um, significantly between a book and and a pan, and um, in that way, kind of get a little bit more experience, both with ex experimental technique and in thinking about how the auditory system work and 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 getting the auditory system to work in a different way. Okay, thanks, guys. Okay, that's homework number two. Um, I can't remember when it's due, but it's also shown on there. Uh, it's going to be on the uh, document on Blackboard. And so, okay, that brings us to the end of the auditory system. And um, our next, we're, we're stepping away from, you finished the, congratulations, you finished the sensory systems of the brain that we're going over. We're talking, we focused on somatosensory system, visual system, and auditory system. Um, you should think about, while it's fresh in your mind, all the similarities across these, differences, uh, across these systems and the differences, the unique elements of uh, what makes each particular system unique. Okay, So that's going to be an important thing to uh, think of in terms of big ideas that came from this next part. And before we move into our higher cognitive aspect of the class, um, the next two lectures will be devoted to the motor system, um, both just the basics of motor control as well as uh, motor diseases, which are very, very common. And um, so just to get you in the mood of the uh, uh, switch from sensory to motor systems, of course, we're now going to be talking about uh, motor output, motor commands that allow you to move. But it really is um, amazing what we can do. And so I tried to come up with a, a nice example of, um, uh, uh, of amazing motor capabilities in humans. And um, what I found was this. I don't even like football, but this is really cool. Okay, what can people do if they really try and that you pay them a lot of money? This, this. So that was, that was the catch, but now they're gonna show it in slow motion. He's catching it between his legs. He's rolling over, it doesn't touch the floor. Touchdown! This one, he throws it, it hits somebody's head, somebody else catches it, and they run to the other end. So you can see it in the next thing. He catches it, bouncing off the guy's helmet, and he's running the other way.
See it again. Whoa. Okay, anyway, somebody's view of the top five catches in football history. Um, so that, that's what we're able to do. That's what we're trying to understand. How can this guy jump up like that, catch a catch, and do a backflip um, um, and, and, you know, win the game? Okay, so that is your context for doing it, and um, what we're going to be going over um, um, in the next two lectures is all different aspects, starting with the muscles. So now we have to talk about actually the physical movements, kind of the mechanics, and the mechanical engineering of what you have to move. Um, uh, we were talking about the pathways uh, from the spinal cord out to, uh, the, uh, um, uh, out to the muscles, uh, the brain stem areas, as well as primary motor cortex that we started talking about um, before. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the muscles and the different kinds of movements. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other thing that we'll talk about, particularly when we get to the um, diseases of um, diseases of the motor system, is not just primary motor cortex, but particularly basal ganglia, a little bit of cerebellum uh, that become damaged in some of these motor um, uh, uh, m motor neurological diseases. Of course, the basal ganglia, as you may know, is a structure uh, significantly and severely impaired in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease as well as Huntington's disease, two common diseases of uh, the motor system. Um, and all of these different areas are supplementary motor areas, um, like, like vision, uh, the final common pathway to be able to act on all this information coming in is the motor system, and we have multiple uh, of these systems that, um, that do things for us. So let's start with the skeletal system and muscles. How do they work? Where are they? Um, what do they do for us? Um, the limbs that we have shapes the way that we can move. So we are not built like jaguars that are so, so fast. We're actually not built that well for running. Um, but we work with what we can have. And we work with not only the limb shape and the stride that we have from those limbs, but the types of joints that connect our bones uh, determines the precise um, um, directions of movements that we can have. So three classic examples of the kinds of joints that we have are um, the ellipsoidal joints, the wrist joints that allow you to go all in a circle, forward and back, lots of freedom of movement. You have a ball and socket hip joint. This is what's replaced in um, hip replacement surgery. This, this round ball and socket wear out and actually becomes very, very painful. So it also has a full range of movements, but uh, unless you're a ballerina or a dancer, you can't get your leg too far uh, um, um, up there, although with, with practice and with, with limbering up some of the tendons and ligaments, you can do that. And then a uh, common one at both the elbow and the knee is the hinge joint, which has one direction um, of motion there. Okay, so some of these have multiple uh, um, directions of motion, uh, um, the ellipsoid, uh, ellipsoidal and the ball and socket. Also the shoulder has many uh, um, degrees of freedom, but other joints like the hinge joint at the knee or the elbow have uh, many fewer degrees of freedom. Um, so smooth muscle, there's two types of muscle, smooth muscle and striated muscle. Muscles are the things that move our bones and our cells. Smooth muscle uh, is, is in the heart and stomach, and it's controlled by, remember what we talked about, the autonomic nervous system. Um, and its function its control is different from skeletal muscles. What we're going to focus on in the next two lectures is striated skeletal muscles, muscles that can be moved voluntarily. Um, muscles attached to bones in ways that indicate the movements that they cause. So for example, a simple uh, um, um, flexion of uh, the bicep um, is uh, determined by the joints and the, the muscles that I have. Uh, also, tendons connect muscles to bones. Um, uh, two important terms that you need to know in terms of uh, the muscles that, that are controlling all the bones are antagonists, 
So biceps contract where, and your triceps are relaxing. So that means biceps and triceps are antagonistic. When one set is contracting, causing the um, relaxation of the other, those two sets of muscles are antagonistic. So the easiest way to uh, remember that is biceps and triceps are antagonistic. Also quadriceps and hamstrings on the front and back of your leg doing the same thing for flexion and extension of your leg are also examples of antagonistic muscle groups. Um, muscles that act together are called synergists. So all the muscles that are contracting together to help um, 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 uh, bring your arm up, those are all synergistic muscles. Okay, and so here's the, here's the example. Uh, the bicep is getting shorter here, uh, contracting, and your tricep is getting longer to allow this, uh, um, this contraction. So your biceps and your triceps are antagonistic muscle groups. Um, what is a muscle? So the next big uh, section is going to be about how muscles work. We know a lot about this. It is a part of the peripheral nervous system and a critical part of the peripheral nervous system. And it starts with the muscle itself. So um, all muscles are composed of individual muscle fibers. Um, and each muscle fiber contains two types of filaments. They're regularly arranged. The thick filaments are called myosin, and the thin filaments are called actin. And the contraction of one of these muscle fibers shortens uh, the, the fiber length, okay? Just like we were seeing the biceps contracting and shortening, um, and gets, it gets thicker as it, as it shortens. Okay, so myosin and actin. Where is this um, taken from? So here is a big muscle. Uh, let's say this is the bicep of this person. And each one of those big bicep mu muscles are made up of individual muscle fibers. And the muscle fibers are made up of very regular arrays of both myosin and actin. Okay, So let's look at one of these little segments of a muscle fiber, an individual muscle fiber. And here it is. So here are the actin filaments. They're thinner, 5 nanometers in diameter. And here are the myosin. They're thicker um, filaments. So the myosin is kind of in the middle. The actin are on the sides. And you see these little heads. What they do is the heads go and they pop right onto um, the actin filaments. And then uh, the contraction is pulling these actin filaments in, uh, which is shortening everything together. Okay, So the actin and myosin sliding against each other with the heads uh, of the myosin attached to the actin is making that whole muscle contract. Does everybody see how that uh, would cause a, a shortening of this whole uh, element right here when, when that happens? So that's how it happens, actin and myosin. And what causes this uh, contraction to happen is everything is what you've learned out about before. It is neurotransmission. It is actually a release of a neurotransmitter from the um, efferent motor neuron onto a muscle. It releases a particular neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. So at all of your muscles, um, uh, uh, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that's working to cause an individual muscle contraction. OK, um, there are two types of um, muscle uh, um, fibers in a striated muscle. Striated muscles, again, are the voluntary muscles that we're going to focus on. <coughs> um, the first type of muscle fiber is the fast twitch muscle fiber. And these types of muscles contract very rapidly, but fatigue very easily. And they're good for short bursts of movement. And the typical example of fast twitch muscle fibers are the fibers uh, in your ocular muscles. Remember that we, we learned about all the different cranial nerves that control uh, movements of the eyes? Well, this is one of your most hardest working muscles because just think about it for a second. Just focus on where your eyes are moving, right? You're moving from your computer. You're looking at me. You're looking at the slide. You're looking around at the person's head in front of you. You're, you're making lots of very fast 
movements. And those are all due to the fast nature of those movements are due to a fast twitch muscle fiber. Now, you would not want your eye movements to be able to help you run away from a lion, OK? That would just not work. They're not strong kind of movements. They're fast, quick movements. Um, fast twitch for fast, quick movements of the eye movements. The other type of strided muscle is slow twitch muscle fibers that contract more slowly but are resistant to fatigue. And a lot of them are in our abdominals, and they're, they're working all the time, um, um, helping us stay up upright all the time, and, and hopefully helping us. Some of, some of us not slouch, but if they're not working, we slouch, and then we get them working again, and then we stand up straight. These are slow twitch muscle fibers. And the example, the nice example that they give in the book is um, the example of, um, you know the difference from them uh, if you eat chicken. So there's white meat chicken and dark meat chicken. The white meat chicken comes from the breast, and the breast is helping um, uh, flap the chicken's wings. The chicken does not fly very far. So it's, it's a very fast onset but rapid movement, and that's why the breast muscles in the chicken are, uh, are light. They are representing the fast twitch muscles. But the leg muscles, the dark meat of the chicken, those are the slow twitch muscles. They keep the chicken upright as it's walking around all the time. OK, so um, uh, you should know that uh, um, these two different types of muscles exist. And the uh, uh, example is eye movements, fast twitch versus slow twitch. But even in your legs, you have fast twitch uh, muscles that help you get going, that help you start off a 50-yard dash, for example. Um, uh, and uh, um, the slow twitch muscles come in to keep you going across those 50 yards. OK, I think I'm going to end here, and then we'll continue on uh, Monday with the rest of the motor system.